Jo, läuft. Läuft. Ja. Zu dir halt nicht. Zu mir. Ja. Alright, episode 71 of Young and Eve, and who's with me today? My name is Jacob Applebaum. Mr. Apfelbaum, uh, why are you here in Berlin? Um, well, a couple of reasons, but I have some friends that live in Berlin that suggested it would be a nice time to, to visit. It's a good summer, so I thought I'd come to Berlin for the summer and do some writing. Cool. So you're on vacation? Everything is super? Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing some work on anonymity and security and privacy related software, but also doing some writing and writing about some of the current events of the world. Why would you work on in anonymity and uh, crypto cryptography and all? What, what, what? I don't even know the word. <laughs> um, why would I work on free software and things yeah. like that? Yeah. I think it's important to work on things that help enable everyone on the planet to be able to securely and freely communicate. I'm working on a thing that helps you to set your clock securely, which is just like a really simple task. But I want it to be something that people are able to do securely without having problems, without having to worry about consequences of using other kinds of software that might have serious security problems or software monoculture, I guess. Isn't that the, the, um, uh, one of the things to do for the, our government or our, uh, our state to protect us? I mean, maybe in Germany, um, <laughs> but I, I tend to think that some of the best things can come from many places and not just from one place. And so I suppose, for example, what I mean by that is that civil society produces lots of useful things and the free software and open source software communities produce useful alternatives, which is not to say that commercial businesses that have closed source software or you know governments that produce things that there's anything wrong with those things but I'd like to make sure that there are alternatives I'd like to make sure that we have the ability to study these systems to modify them to share our changes these are important important things to do and so is it the the role of the state well maybe I mean I hear the BSI funds free software development which sounds really great and it's especially great when that free software development is done in the open and when the result is free software available to all and it's usable and it's integrated in things and it's you know something that we can all study and improve upon what's the difference between free and closed software well free and open source software versus closed software is a really long discussion which is pretty boring for most people but the short version of it is that it's free as in beer and it's free as in speech so that is to say it's almost certainly available to you at no cost, although someone can sell it if they wish. Mm -hmm. But when you acquire this free and open source software, you have the source code as well as the actual program that you would run, which means that you can change this, you can study it, you can modify it, and other people, when it's freely licensed, in some cases are encouraged or required to share the changes that they make. This is uh, sort of like inside baseball licensing discussion. But um, this, This idea of free and open source software is very different than, say, with closed source software where someone will give you a program and you're not allowed to look at it or you're allowed to look at it but it takes a great deal of skill because the actual source code that produces the program is not available. You're definitely not allowed to change it and you're certainly not supposed to share your changes. Now, legally, you can get away with many of these things but it's very impractical to do this and it's very difficult. Whereas with free and open source software, usually the source code is available to you And it's encouraged, in fact, for you to make these modifications. So instead of being dependent on one company or a few companies to make these changes, communities can do it. So, so, f so free is better? Well, I think free and open source software allows for more to be done. But that does not necessarily mean it is better, right? I mean, f there's an old quote from uh, a guy in San Francisco by the name of Jamie Zwinski says something along the lines of free software is only free if your time is worth nothing. Hmm. And I mean, I think that is true. Some free software is very hard to use or it's not particularly pretty to look at. But this is sort of the cost of having software that you can look at and see, does it betray my privacy? Um, does it do as it says? Um, they claim that it is secure. How do we know that it is secure? 
or they claim that it is safe. What does safe mean? Mm -hmm. And to be able to study it is absolutely a critical part of understanding whether or not these pieces of software or these systems, they live up to their claims. Apropos safe, um, I've heard a little about Big Brother in the last couple of weeks. Could you, could you explain to me what that means? Well, I mean, Big Brother is a reference to George Orwell, if that's what you mean. No, who's George Orwell? <laughs> So George Orwell is a pretty famous British writer uh, from the 20th century. Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Go on. And uh, he, he wrote a really great book called Homage to Catalonia. It's actually my favorite of all of his books. And that was about the Spanish anarchists fighting against the Franco-fascists. And he also wrote a number of other books. And one of his most famous books, of course, everyone knows, is 1984. Never heard of it. Yeah, and another really famous one is called Animal Farm. Never heard of it. Mm. Well, so all three of these books deal with equality, and all three of these books deal with human society. But Homage to Catalonia is essentially a true story, mm -hmm. and it's the story of the anarchists versus the fascists in Spain. Whereas Animal Farm is, uh, you know, it's an allegory. It's told from the perspective of these animals living on a farm where they start off as equals and they sort of slowly but surely merge into different classes in society uh, the farm society and in 1984 you have something that is quite similar except they don't start off with equality and it's not a really happy book you could say and it's about this notion that you're always being watched you're always um, being judged you're always being thought about and there are very severe and harsh punishments for going outside of the normative thinking patterns and so Orwell, when he writes about these things, he writes about them rooted in his experiences. And he has really deep experiences having fought against the fascists and having been shot by the fascists in the, in the Spanish War, Sp Spanish Civil War. And so he, the rest of his books reflect this. And so who is Big Brother? Yeah. Big Brother is us. Us. I mean, that's, that's the part of the point anyway. It's that we watch each other, we watch ourselves, we build systems that then watch us, and those systems then, in some cases, are quite harsh. Is that bad? Well, I mean, it depends. Um, it can be quite bad. I think that to be at liberty is to be free from suspicion. And so when we are not free from suspicion, when we are innocent, then we aren't free. And we can't have freedom without freedom from suspicion first. Why, why, do, we, why do we have to be free from suspicion? Well, as I just said, if we, uh, if we don't have freedom from suspicion when we're innocent in particular, it's as if all of us are guilty. And for all of us to be guilty without any actual particularized suspicion creates a very different mental model for a person of Why? the world. Why? Oh, you know, when your neighbors watch you and they judge you, you have a sort of double consciousness, or one does. You know, many women in the world have a double consciousness. How do I look? How do other people see me? And that kind of double consciousness is a very oppressive thing. And at the same time, for many women that I know, the double consciousness is a matter of safety. If they see how they see themselves, and then they see how someone on the street might see them, they understand that maybe they need to do something differently, or maybe they need to work towards societal change so that those people don't treat them badly. But they're at least aware of it. But that kind of double consciousness is a kind of oppression, right? I mean, this is kind of the uh, part of the root of feminist action, actually. And this notion of equality is very important. And so when we all have this double consciousness, it has the same oppressive outcome. And that isn't to say that only women should have it, because obviously that's not the case. No one should have this double consciousness mm -hmm. and really have to be mindful of it. It should be the case that we should be free from these kinds of concerns. And suspicion is one of those concerns. So how do I look? How do other people see me in the double consciousness? Is it it's part of that, right? Okay. It's, that, it's that notion like, well, how would a police officer see me if they saw my phone cross paths with someone else? And how would they see me if they saw what I had been browsing on the web? And how would they see me if they know that I, I called this doctor who specializes in this particular kind of problem, right? And what they would see from that would be very revealing. It would violate the very notion of what privacy is. So why is that bad? Yeah. Well, it depends on whether or not agency and dignity, choice, if those things are important to have, then privacy is also an important thing to have. Then freedom from suspicion is also an important thing to have. So it's a, it's a societal question, but it's also an individual question, which is best asked as, do you wish to be able to be free? Do you wish to be able to be free from other people thinking they understand you by having seen some data about you? People can make the wrong decisions about you looking at things which are completely true.
you took a train here, you talked to this person, you saw these things, you participated in this, you went shopping at this store, you regularly buy this thing, but one day you bought something completely different. Okay. And that, that tells a story about you, but it's not necessarily the true story. Sometimes it tells a completely different story because the person narrating with your data may not have your best interests in mind. Whose interests do they have in mind? It's not clear. It depends on who it is, right? If it's the state, in some cases, they reasonably or unreasonably have the interests of the people in the state in mind. If it's someone who's us, a... Us or the people in the state? Who are you talking about there? Depends on which state, and it depends on which state is judging you. I mean, in the case of Germany, I guess it would be whether or not the Americans are benevolent. Which, I mean, as an American, I guess you've heard about Guantanamo Bay and the Iraq War and the Afghan War. A little bit. Yeah, so, I mean, the Americans are not always benevolent, though we have some benevolence in us. And that's something to consider, which is that even the best of people make the worst of mistakes. So, uh, what you just told me is like uh, being watched or just thinking you're being watched, uh, you know, it harms your freedom, right? Sure. Uh, It can. So, and, and you also say we are being watched. Yep. In what way? And how? Well, there are a couple of different ways. I mean, this in Germany, I think it's Datenspeicher or something like that. Yeah. Vorratsdatenspeicher? Yeah, for example. This is a kind of watching, right? Imagine. Uh, how, 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 how are they watching? Well, so we have to be very clear about what it means to watch because there are different kinds of watching, right? As the sign says behind us, The things that are in front of our eyes are the hardest to see. And so it's very easy to see, for example, that internet service providers and telephone companies, they, they say directly on the contracts or in the law that they record information about us. Why would they do that? Sometimes because the European Union and sometimes because German law requires them. Sometimes because it is profitable for business reasons. Sometimes because of fear mongering about terrorism. Usually it's race baiting or Islamophobia but in general I think that that's really? fear fear of terrorism is a really big one and also fear of child pornography fear of um, money laundering and fear of you know child pornography as a general scary thing right and these are the four horsemen of the infopocalypse this idea that uh, you know effectively we have these like awful things in society and because of those awful things we must sacrifice Our freedoms and of so of course of course right of course we, i mean aren't you against uh, child pornography aren't you against terrorism yeah for sure we, we, we gotta fight it yeah absolutely that's why you and, should uh, stop supporting imperialist american wars right because what is terror what is terrorism terrorism is using violence for political ends mm -hmm. so what is war war is terrorism by other means at a larger scale so you're saying the drone wars are or the uh, drone attacks are, are terrorist attacks Absolutely. When you attack people in a sovereign nation with a flying robot to kill people, that's uh, that sounds like terrorism to me. Just like as if you were to commandeer someone else's flying machine and crash it into a building, that would be terrorism. And for people that are not in the military and doing these things and who are not actually uh, fighting with these people in this battle, everyone else, that's us, caught in between, I would say that that's... Um, There's a difference between them, for sure. But the difference is not necessarily in their methods. It's usually just in the scale. And I want no part of that. And I think that you don't, uh, to paraphrase Audrey Lord, you won't destroy the master's house using the master's tools. So if you want to stop people that are violent, using violence to stop it, you know, might work in that you might eventually kill every single one of those people. But that's maybe actually not going to work in that all of the people that aren't yet violent will be, become radicalized through it. I mean, you actually see that in response to some of these acts of terrorism in the United States. There are lots of people that sign up to be soldiers. So violence seems to beget more violence. I mean, that's kind of an old lesson. For Christian Germany, I suppose that's not such a, such a strange thing, actually. It makes sense. But so what does it mean to be watched? What it means to be watched is... What it, what it means to be watched is that you have different kinds of watching. You have watching with human eyes, and you have watching with machines that record things. Machines. That's right. So your cell phone, it records things around you as part of its operation. You've got one there? Yeah. Uh, how? Well, I mean, it's a sensor platform. It knows which way you're turning it. Now, is that recorded? Well, it depends if you have that German-made FinFisher spyware crap on your telephone. You know, the stuff that some of the Landa install on criminals' telephones. You look like a journalist. You might be a criminal. And so, Probably. Yeah, absolutely, right? I, I asked the, the U.S. ambassador like two months ago about Pfizer before the whole scandal broke. And it was like, okay, am I being potentially monitored by, by you guys? And he was like, 
No, no. Relax, we play by the rules. And he assured me I was not, but apparently he lied. It's also possible he didn't know. I mean, a lot of people... Yeah. No. I mean, I do think, but I don't think he knew. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not actually sure that he would know, and it's hard to know for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, don't they have to know? I mean, the U.S. ambassador, U.S. president, uh, aren't they the forefront of uh, the politics of your country? I mean, a thing that starts off as a 10,000-word report probably becomes a single line on, a, on another report on his desk, right? So huh. does he know everything? M you know, maybe he knows at a very high level, but, you know, he's not a signals intelligence person, and I'm guessing the ambassador, unless he started off as a signals intelligence person, probably neither of them know the deep, deep details of that, and they probably don't actually know whether or not you are wiretapped. But I think it's safe to say that they would be aware about whether or not they could wiretap you, whether or not they accidentally, unwittingly wiretap you, I think is the phrase. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think they have many, many concerns. I mean, I try not to paint them as, you know, being the architects of these things or understanding them in total, just like I'm sure they don't understand everything about their own, ar you know, their agricultural policy or they don't know everything about their own environmental policy. I mean, when you have... America has an envir environmental policy? That would, that's news to me. <laughs> Do they? Yeah, sev several. Really? I'm sure. I'm sure of it. Yeah, I mean, it's not anything to write home about, that's for sure. <laughs> But, I mean, uh, I think if we return to the question of being watched, I think yes. the thing to recognize is that it's very easy to imagine the horrors of someone steaming open every single letter. Well, in the United States... Who would do that? Well, I mean, in German history, I guess there have been different groups that have steamed letters in order to open them. And what I mean is it's easy to imagine that. That's a thing which we have experienced in the 20th century. In the United States, in the 21st century, we actually seem to take photographs of the outside of all letters as it travels through the United States. That was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. The, the real letters, not the emails, letters. That's right, the postal letters. So as to be able to trace them. They take pictures. They take pictures of the outside of the envelopes. They may also open some of them, in some cases under order. And according to the New York Times, I believe what they said was that without a court order. So, like, a person in the post office can make the decision to open the letter to look inside it. What? Right, exactly. So that seems pretty crazy, right? So we can imagine that. Yeah. So likewise, what we could imagine is that it's not just letters. And in fact, we have the equivalent of those steaming machines for the internet. When we have data retention, what is it? It's the equivalent of opening every single email and looking inside of it and taking a copy and putting it into a hard drive or putting it into a database. Whose email? Well, when data retention exists, whatever data is going to be held in this data retention system, for example, who's been calling who, and uh, what you know, amount of time the call lasted for, that would go there, and that would be for everyone. It's like, it's like, a, like a data fridge where, where, where they op open it up, uh, unfreeze what they want to uh, get unfreeze, and uh, take a look inside? Yeah, for example, the difference between the NSA's program and the German idea of data retention is that the German people have only themselves to blame, whereas the Americans can blame the NSA f and say they did not know. Huh. Really? It seems like that's a fair thing to say, although most of the German people that I have met either do not understand it or they understand it and they're really mad about it. So I don't really feel like there's blame for them so much as it is to say that at least you have some democratic debate and some openness about it. But the political will to change it is very difficult to muster because it is such a hard to understand problem. But phone calls being recorded, whether or not it's legitimate for the German government to do this, The irony is that because the German government wishes to be able to wiretap people, because they wish to be able to monitor people, and they have this whole legal system and this whole regime set up to be able to do that, they've left technically the ability for anyone to do that. And a machine doesn't understand, for example, whether or not there's a lawful German order, or it's a Chinese computer hacker, or it's the NSA. So by leaving everyone vulnerable on the hopes that maybe they'll wiretap someone someday, or maybe they'll do some recording of data every day. Mm -hmm. Everyone is vulnerable all of the time. That's maybe not the right trade-off to make, and as a result, the NSA and other spy agencies are able to make a completely different set of choices that completely circumvent all of the democratic and reasonable processes that Germany may have decided on openly, and some of these things have been decided on in a decidedly secret way. But for the most part, the key lesson here is that because we keep ourselves vulnerable to occasionally compromise someone's privacy, other more powerful entities can do whatever they want. You were talking about the NSA quite a lot. Uh, what does NSA mean? Well, NSA 
used to jokingly be no such agency, but it's the National Security Agency. So they're the world's greatest collection of mathematicians and signals intelligence people. They work on things like graph theory, cryptography. Uh, they work on all kinds of um, intelligence gathering operations all around the world from like electromagnetic radiation, uh, you know, of like uh, wires traversing the ground to light in fiber optic cables to satellite communication systems. Whatever is communicating, their job is to discover information about it and then from that to be able to, you know, take that information and turn it in, into some kind of actionable item or product. Yeah, but why are they interested in that information? Well, power. Power? Information is power. So when why? you have information on the entire planet, you have power over the whole planet. So by knowing what uh, people do in Germany, they, they have power over them? Of course. How? Well, for example, how is it that you can be free if someone knows everything that you've done that you wouldn't want to be public? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm an innocent person. I don't do anything stupid. 99% of pe Germans do the same. So why, why, why would they care? But it isn't for you to judge. It's for the people that record the data to judge that. It's, of course, the case that if you have the opportunity to explain yourself, let's say in a court of law, mm -hmm. then, of course, you would be able to say, no, no, I just went to the grocery store. But you see, the thing is that, for example, in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, if you can even call it a court, the only people that get to go before the judge is the U.S. government. There are no defendants. There are no people that adversarially argue one way or the other. Hmm. And so the question that I would ask is, why is it that you think that you would be able to explain that you're innocent when there is no one there to advocate for your innocence? And what happens then when that information, it turns out, is used not to take you to a court, but instead is to take more drastic action. So, for example, these signature strikes with drones. The signature they refer to is not a human signing off on it, but rather that the pattern someone leaves behind has been determined to be the pattern of a dangerous person. So if you happen to buy a used cell phone because it's a great deal, you might pick up the phone of someone who is dangerous, make some calls, and if you're in Pakistan, Yemen, let's say some other places, right. 70 countries in the world, there might be drones. And that's really quite a serious thing. But that's kind of outside of the realm for most Germans. So we can imagine some other things that could occur. For example, traveling inside of Europe. What happens when, just accidentally, some of the data matches you? This happened to a regular American fellow who, during the Spanish train bombings, he was accidentally picked as one of the people that was a suspect. So the U.S. government did things like break into his house to take DNA samples. They went and broke into his computers. They did all these things in secret. They did it all under the undercover. And eventually he was able to sue them and to win. But basically this came from the fact that there was one mistaken fingerprint found somewhere near the train in Spain that had been blown up. And as a result, his life was thrown into complete disarray, and his family's life was thrown into complete disarray. Because when they searched a database and found a thing that was closest to that fingerprint, the Americans went absolutely crazy in secret after him. And it was only because, as I understand the story, the Spanish didn't believe that it was him. It was only because of that that they really looked elsewhere for other evidence. And eventually he was exonerated, but not before he was already punished in a sense. So whether or not we think that will happen to us is not the question. The question is whether or not we think it is right for those things to happen to other people, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family members, to people we care about. And if the answer is, as long as it doesn't happen to oneself, well, that's not much of a society. That sounds like a, a sort of nightmare where we really, if we were to only really care about ourselves directly, well, then we wouldn't. I think have much in terms of a life worth living. I mean, that's a really awful way to look at the world. And so what do regular people have to fear? They have to fear the fact that they will have to fear each other. They have to fear the fact that they switch from being innocent until proven guilty to being effectively guilty and guiltier, which is not a really great choice in my opinion. They have to fear the fact that some of these governments do really awful things that are extra legal, whether it's extraordinary rendition and torture, whether it's drone strikes, whether it's secret entry into houses to take DNA and fingerprint samples, whether it's breaking into computers or wiretapping telephones, all of those things. 
but those but are not the things we want to see in free and democratic societies. Right. Right. This is the Foucault, I think, would talk about this in the framework of moving from a disciplined society to a control society. So imagine one day you're a suspect. So all your credit cards stop working. All your telephones are wiretapped. Everything you say on the phone is now used against you. Every word you say is scrutinized. It's 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 looked at as if it's something completely different than it actually is. When you have a cute name for your girlfriend or your boyfriend, then what what happens? It looks like you're a spy using a code name, right? I mean, Germany has been in this place before. And so what I hope is that Germany can help to lead the rest of the world without having to make the mistakes that Germany has made in the past. We don't need a world filled with spies. Mm -hmm. We don't, I think, want to have endless war. I don't think we want to have secret courts where you don't even have the right to defend yourself. Prison camps where you never get a trial, right? That's what Camp Guantanamo Bay is. So it's scary, it's scary stuff. And the flying robots seem very far away now, but how far away can they be when Germany has their own flying robots, right? Drones, like the one that nearly crashed into a passenger plane yeah. in Afghanistan, yeah. where they won't even add the anti-collision sensors to those because they don't actually care about things they might collide with because where will they be flying? Obviously places where it's nobody that matters to Germany. Right. That's maybe not the world I want to live in, it's definitely not the world that I want to live in. So my parents now would say, well, we're never online, we, do, we, don't, we hardly have an email address, so like, uh, I mean, they actually go online like once a month. So they'd be saying like, well, we, we don't care about this whole online surveillance because we are not online. Why would you, what would you tell them? Well, that's really easy. You don't have a choice in whether or not you're online. Your data is online. Oh. Well, for example, if you have a telephone, And, do. You make phone, do. and you make phone calls. How do you suppose the bills are generated, right? Through business relationships that traverse the internet. And on the offhand chance that the bill for your specific phone company really is done just with a person and a spreadsheet, huh. or really it's done all by hand in a book, um, which I find hard to believe, I think that it becomes very clear that whether or not we are actually on the internet directly, there is no separation between the physical world that we're in now and the internet. When you are, for example, here, everyone around you has cell phones, right? Everyone nearby that makes a phone call, this data of the voice, of, of the actual website traffic, these things, it's, it's in proximity to you. And also, when you speak, you actually connect in a sense, through that, right? So our data is constantly sort of spread out through different systems. And whether or not we have decided to actually go online, to browse the web, to type in something, that is just one very small piece of a much larger puzzle. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's part one.